Hey, good afternoon. Hey, how you doing? Uh, happy Sunday. Again, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, I'm coming back to you this Sunday afternoon. I have three teachings back to back. This one's called The Spirit of the Cretans. And as you've seen on TikTok, I taught a little bit on that and I converted part one, part two, maybe three versions over, but the Holy Spirit impressed me to reiterate and go back to this because what's important about the teaching on the spirit of the creation, and I want you to try to understand what did the Christians do? Who are they? Where did they come from? And after you after you hear this, you're going to see the spirit that's trying to be poured out in the church to people that are satanic. You're going to see where it started and how it's continuing today. And then we're going to deal with it. Okay, so my introduction is in an island called Crete. Crete is 100 miles south in the Mediterranean. And I want you to listen up. If you want to take notes, you can take notes. Crete is the largest island in the Mediterranean, just south of Greece. It actually belongs to Greece. And it's a hundred miles south of Greece in the South Mediterranean Sea. Now, in ancient times, listen to this, and in Greek history, in their culture, they had men that were called mercenaries or mercenary seamen who used to sail the sea there were a wild bunch of guys like in the military. They were men of mixed breed from different races that were in Greece at that time. And there's still some living on the island, island now. They're actually mobsters and gangsters. Now, when I speak about that, you're probably thinking about Italy and Sicily and the mob and the mafia. Let me tell you something about the Mediterranean Sea. It was all types of islands, all the way between France and Italy, all the way down from the North Mediterranean to the South Mediterranean. And let me tell you something about my experience in Corsica, in Sardinia, Corsica, which... It's a little bit further north than the North Seas. It belongs to France, but they speak a mixture of French and Italian. Then you have Sardinia, which is a little bit further south, which belongs to Italy. They speak more of a mixture of Italian and French. It's kind of confusing, right? So Corsica, which belongs to the French, Napoleon was born there. Most of you studied the history about 1813 about Napoleon capturing France and the countries and all that stuff. He's from there. His grave is right there on the side of the beach, right there in Ajaxio, Corsica, which is the capital. Now, let me tell you something about these islands all the way down to Sicily. Today, they're all mobsters. They're all mafia-type syndicate people. You don't go to those islands running your mouth and messing around the wrong way. You're liable to get shot. You're liable not to make it out of there. But back in the ancient times, they had ships they used to sail in. And they had these wild missionary seamen that were wild. They just did crazy things.
These were men that would oppose their own country. The rebels, they will fight against the government. They fight against the powers that be. They don't care. They don't agree with it. They're fighting. This is the way it was. So even when it came to religion, you had three different type of Greece people, Greek people from Greece. And the Christians, which is also part of Greece, was one of these three types. Either they were converted over to the Greek Orthodox Jewish religion who took their teachings from the first five books of the law, the books of Moses, and they were converted into Judaism. They did not believe in Jesus Christ. Just like the Jews that put Jesus on the cross they believe it, that all men should be circumcised and the whole thing. And they believe in the law and they don't teach grace. You can forget it. So they don't follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. They don't follow the New Testament teachings. They follow strictly the first five books of the, of the Old Testament, first five books of the Old Testament and the prophets. And they're still living in that time. Number two, then you had your typical modern day Greek people who believed in gods and goddesses, not our God, but they had their own God. They had their statues. They had their, their statues of idolatry. Zeus was one of them. Zeus was a man that can believe that man can become a God. And a lot of them still believe in that philosophy today. These are the same Greek that in the book of Acts they had statues and symbols of gods and goddesses. Listen to what I'm saying. That were in the capital of Greece, which is Athens, Greece. And they worshipped these statues. Paul went there trying to show them that their God is not the God that you're looking for. The God that I know of, I'm about to tell you about, that you know not of. Because there was an inscription written when Paul went to Athens, waiting for Titus and the rest of the gang and Timothy. And there was a subscription to the unknown God. Now, I, I don't know where these people got that from, but Paul had to come and try to give them a lesson. Then you had, number three, the Hellenist Jews, the Hellenist Greek Jewish people, who, when Paul came and taught the word of God, when the Gentiles came and taught the word of God, when Apollos and all of them came there, when Titus came there, they received the word of God with boldness. They fell in love with Jesus Christ and they gave their lives to the teachings of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you either had those three type of Jews. But there was a big problem among the Greek. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 17 and I want to show you what the issue's at. And I want you to see the kind of trial and tribulations that Paul, the apostles, all of them went through dealing with people from these nations. Now, you got to understand, these people were deeply rooted into their gods and goddesses. Now, say, for example, me and you, we come to their country. They've been en endowed with these gods and goddesses since they were born, throughout generations after generations. This is all they've known. And you're coming with the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to get them to change their mindset towards coming after the God that you believe in. And they're sitting there listening to you. 
But at the same time, they think the God that you're presenting is ridiculous. How can a man die and come back to life again? How can a man die for the sins of the world and take all, all this turmoil on himself and die and come back to life? And then you say in the spirit realm, he came back and slapped Satan. Who's Satan? And took the keys of hell and death. Wait a minute. I don't know nothing about that. Never heard of it. You you would be strange to them, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? And I want you to I want you to put yourself in Thessalonica, the Church of Thessalonica, shoes. And I want you to hear this and how the Greek were receiving Paul. And I want you to understand that today you have people that do not believe. They call themselves atheists, but I don't believe that they're atheists. I believe they're agnostic because as Gnostic, believe, they believe that there is a God, but they don't want to believe. They know that there's a God. They know about God. That's agnostic. They've heard the word of God, but they don't want to believe. And atheists is somebody that never, ever heard about God. So that's the difference. Agnostic. Yeah, you heard there's a God. You know there's a God somewhere. That's for, if you have an accident and some, the first thing come out your mouth, oh my God. But you said my God, but you don't believe there's a God. So how can you be one way and be another? It can't be a self, same expression, because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And life and death is in the power of your tongue, and you shall eat the fruit thereof. So you're speaking what's in your heart. So if you said, my God, that means you believe there's a God. You just don't want to believe. Because you're looking at the circumstances in the earth. I'm talking about the spirit of the Christians. Uh, I want you, let's look at verse 1. I'm going to read this from the Amplified. Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Now, after Paul and Silas had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, he's in Greece, okay? Not in Athens yet. But he's starting to go out to teach the word of God. Now, these were your Christian not the Christian, but this is where your Greek Orthodox Jews, where he's going into the synagogue and he's trying to get them converted. Listen to this. And Paul entered the synagogue as was his custom. This is what he normally did. And three Sabbath, three weeks in a row, every Saturday, three Saturdays in a row, he engaged in discussion and friendly debate with them from the scriptures. What was he talking about from the scriptures? Check this out. Explaining and pointing out the scripture evidence that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and raise from the dead, saying, this Jesus, whom I'm proclaiming to you, listen to this, listen to this, whom I proclaim to you is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed. See, the Jews were looking for Christ, the anointed, but they thought he was going to come one way, but he already came. And he showed the signs and the wonders, and they did not even recognize him. So these are the Jews that believe like the other Jews in Jerusalem that the Messiah never came. And Paul's trying to convince him that the Messiah already came. Check this. And some of them, and, and check this out. And he said, this Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed. Okay? Look at verse 4. And some of them were persuaded. Okay? And some of them believed of them, were persuaded to believe and joined Paul 
and Silas, fearing Greeks, and many of the leading women. Now, these were the Hellenistic Jews. Excuse me, the Hellenistic Greek or the Hellenistic Jews who received Paul's teachings. Okay? So you had those type of Greek people. Okay? So they were converted over. And some of them, verse 4, were persuaded and believed and joined Paul and Silas along with the large number of the God-fearing Greeks and many leading women. There were a lot that were converted over. But the unbelieving Jews, the Orthodox Greek Orthodox Jews, listen to this, became jealous and asked and taking along some things from the low lowlifes in the marketplace, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar that then attacking Jason's house. Because see, Paul and Silas was already gone. But they knew where the church was at. And back in this time, they had church in people's houses. So they knew that these Christians or these people of the way, because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what they used to call them before they called them Christians, was children of the way. They knew that they were at Jason's house. So they went to Jason's house looking for Paul and Silas. Check this. And they went with a mob of people, lowlifes. Who were those lowlifes? Some of them were Christians. Some of them were Greek people that were poor. Some of them were the wild bunch that I told you were those mercenary seamen. So you had three different types of Greece, Greeks. And two of them opposed Apostle Paul, the church that was in Jason's house in Greece, and the teachings. Check this. I want you to get this. But the unbelieving Jews became jealous along with some of the other low lives in the marketplace and they formed the mob in verse 5 and set the city on uproar. Then attacking Jason's house, tried to bring Paul and Silas out to the people. But when they failed to find them, listen to this, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city of council and authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Notice they said they turned the world upside down because signs and wonders and miracles and the power of God was being demonstrated through the hands of Paul and Silas and the other apostles and the people that were in Jason's house. And people were flocking to them, wanting to become part of them because of the camaraderie, because of the love of God, because of the healings, because of the deliverance power of God. Check this. Because of the love of God too. Check this. But when they failed to find them, they dragged Jason and the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men have turned the world upside down and have come here too. And Jason has welcomed them into his house and protected them. And they are all saying things contrary to the decrees of Caesar, actually claiming that there's another king called Jesus. See, they had this thing all mixed up. Jesus is the king over kings, over the whole universe in the world. Not here in the natural to rule in the flesh, to rule over Caesar. Because he also told the disciples, he also told the people in Rome, render what Caesar belongs to Caesar. Render what God belongs to God. God is omnipotent, almighty, omnipresent. He's the power, he's the authority, he's the majesty. He's all that in the bag of chips over all men. He is the creator of all men. But they had this thing all confused. They thought, oh, he was coming. They're teaching this new doctrine. But they never understood 
what they were talking about. Now, look at verse 8. They stirred up a crowd. And the city's authorities who heard these things, and when they had taken security bail from Jason and the others, they let Jason and them go. Now, this is Paul and another place in Greece called Berrera. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away at night to Berrera. And when they arrived, they entered the Jewish synagogue again. Now, Berrera was actually 10 miles, 10 to 15 miles from Thessalonica, from where Paul and Silas had already went into the temple. This is 10 miles, 10 to 12 miles away. Now, they didn't have cars back then. They had a horse and a buggy. It may have took you days to go 12 miles, about maybe a whole 24 hours to go 12 miles to get to Paul and Silas. So again, in this next town, they were just bold as a lion. Went into the synagogue again. You figure after they learned, after the mob went against them the first time at Thessalonica, they would stop. See, you would stop. <laughs> you said, forget this. They don't want to hear what I got to say. So I'm going to shut my mouth and just be quiet for a season. Paul, no, not Paul and Silas. They went right back in the synagogue again. And, and, and the Jewish synagogue at that. Now, these people were more noble and open-minded than those in Thessalonica. They were more in the scripture. They, they were more open-minded toward the things of the spirit. So, check this out. So they received the message of salvation through faith in Christ that came out of Paul and Silas's mouth. They received it because he showed them in Isaiah 53. I believe he took them to, to scriptures all up in Jeremiah. I believe he took them to the law of Moses and to the Psalms of David and explained everything. I believe he took them to the book of Joel where it says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream. Your young men shall see visions. And show them to Christ from the Old Testament perspective. Now check this. They all received the message of salvation by faith through Jesus Christ. With great eagerness, explaining the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. So these people weren't ignorant. They went right to the word. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't believe what a person is saying, and you don't believe it, go look it up in the scripture. Go look it up and see it for yourself. Don't judge by what pastor so-and-so say. You go home and pick up the book for yourself and find out what the scriptures are saying. Now, yesterday, 6th of June, January, I was opposed by some sister. And what she said in the message, why are you doing on, what are you doing on our victory page or victory outreach page, page, which I've been affiliated with victory outreach for years, since the 90s. Really since, the, yeah, since the 90s. And um, I know about Nikki Cruz crossing the switchblade. I know about David Wilkerson, the late David Wilkerson. I am from New York City where David Wilkerson and the Victory Out Outreach Church actually started. And she opposed me and she said that something about scripture and verse. Now, sister, if you're listening and you said you go to Victory Outreach, my cousin in Philadelphia, Alvin Olage, and his wife, who's Mexican, Julie, they go to Victory Outreach in Philadelphia. I was invited to come on to Victory Outreach's site and ask to teach the Word of God. I'm a teacher of the Word of God. Now, this sister opposed me and said, Scripture and verse, that's, but never gave me an explanation why she couldn't stand me and my wife's ministry and started putting me down. You, why don't you start your own? Why are you here on our site 
John, are you part of this? Of course I am. But the other day, I got restricted from Facebook because it was somebody like this sister that complained about my teachings, which is sound doctrine and the truth of the word of God. I wasn't offended. I just asked him, what was the problem? I, te I texted back. I didn't get no response yet. What did I teach that was so false? I teach sound doctrine. I was hewed from some of the best teachers. And plus, I had the opportunity to visit overseas to the motherland and to countries where Paul the Apostle had walked. So I, I, I also was around Jewish rabbis who taught the word of God from a Jewish, Orthodox Jewish perspective as well as a Christian Jew, Messianic Jew perspective. So I kind of understand both sides of the fence. So when I explain things, yes, I might be a little ghetto in New York in my approach. Some people may not like it. Maybe that was the reason why she reported me to Facebook. I don't know. They didn't want to, or oh, I'm just too aggressive in my teachings, like some people were saying. Paul the Apostle was aggressive. Peter was aggressive. So was Titus. They were aggressive in their teachings. Okay? Jesus, when he turned the money changers and the tables over, and he said, do not make my house a den of thieves, Jesus was very aggressive when it came to sin. But it, mean, it didn't, doesn't mean that he hated. It means that he loved. It means that he was being stern. When God deals with us, when we're hard-headed, he can be aggressive. And he'll, you want it to have it your way? I'm going to take my hand. I'm letting Satan get a hold of you. And that's where the aggression comes in. And it's going to cause you either to bow or get your life together. But to oppose me, I'm a man of God. I made mistakes. I taught this thing, and I believe I taught it right, by the book. There's some people that don't even know what's in it. So for you to oppose me, sister, I think you're out of order. You need to talk to my cousin, Alvin Olage, or maybe talk to my wife. I'm a happily married man, and I've been in this ministry thing for several years, for many years. So I do understand the things of God. I don't mind the opposition, but don't jump on me. Ask me a question first and tell me where I went wrong and where I erred in the scriptures. Show me. Show me in the book. Or am I too black and my wife is too white for you? Is that the problem? And you just don't want to see a black man teach it? Or do I teach it aggressive because I'm from New York City and my backing is from New York? I mean, what is it? I'm teaching the truth. You may not like the way I teach. Okay. I'm no longer on Victory Outreach's page because I was skeptic about who had me blocked on Facebook and I cannot be blocked. I have a ministry, a radio ministry. I have authored two books. I've been all around the world teaching this word. And I was up under some of the best of the best. They're dead and gone. Billy Joe Doherty, who's my spiritual father, Victory Christian Center out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, Miles Monroe, who's from the Bahamas. Dr. Oral Roberts, who's my spiritual grandfather. Willie S. Darden, who's from Enfield, North Carolina. Nothing but sound doctrine. And if they were alive, they would tell you to your face that brother's teaching the truth from the word. And if, until you open the book and see it for yourself, sister, maybe you need to open the book and see it for yourself and listen. And don't just take people in stride because they have an attitude. Some people have different convictions concerning the spirit. There's a white sister I know out of Queens, New York. She's a prophetess. And she's just as mean as me in your face. And don't take no mess with nobody. And I love the sister. I love to hear her preach. Okay? Preaching with authority. With power. You know, that's what it's all about. Laying hands on the sick and they're recovered. Speaking in people's life and stuff being done. Seeking God 
and being able to understand the things of the spirit. So sister, before you critic people, understand and look at their teachings and see what they're teaching, the truth of the word. And judge it based on that. Don't judge it by the person's, by way, the way the person preaches. Judge it by what he's teaching. Learn to eat chicken and spit out the bones. That's what I say. Just like the other day, there was one sister that said, if you don't plead the blood of Jesus, you're not a man of God. Well, everything that she taught was the truth up until when she said that. But that's not going to determine whether she goes to heaven or go to hell. That's not going to determine whether I go to heaven or go to hell. Now, what I know about the blood, Jesus said is blood for our sins. So you don't have to help him and plead the blood because it's already been done when he sacrificed it on the cross. Now, if you say that, you're wrong. But at the same time, I learned to still receive that sister's teaching. And whatever she says that's derogatory to the word, but it's not going to count me to go to heaven or hell, I'll just get that out of my ear and listen to the meat. You understand? See, some of us need to learn etiquette. We need to learn wisdom of the word. And learn to understand where people is coming from. There are some things I say that may sound out of context to you. But if I'm showing you in scripture, I must be telling the truth. Okay? The Christians had this problem. Where they would take one scripture and they would twist it. And they would argue with you for days. Saying the Bible says this. How many of you know people like that? And it's, the Bible is not saying what they're saying. And you can take the Bible and show it to them and try to preach to them to your face turn blue and they still don't get it. This is the part of the spirit of the Christians. Now, who was I? Look at Acts chapter 17. And it says, now these people were more noble in verse 11 and open-minded than those of the Thessalonica, Thessalonican people. So they received the message of salvation through faith in Christ. With great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily, that's what I was telling you. Don't just go by what I say. Examine the scriptures for yourself to see if these things are so. Just like these people from Berrera. As a result, verse 17, Many of them became believers together with the number of prominent Greek men and women. But 10 miles away, verse 13, but when the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God concerning eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ had been also preached by Paul and Barrera, uh-oh, 12, 13 miles down the road away. They came there too. Took them about a day, but they got there. Agitating and disturbing the crowds. So at this time, the brothers immediately sent Paul away to go as far as the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there in Barrera. So they really were after Paul. They weren't after Silas. They weren't after Timothy. They wanted Paul's head. So they sent them on the boat. And those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens. And after receiving instruction from Paul for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible, they left. So he's in Athens now. Now, this is what I want you to understand about the Cretans and also about the Greek people. I want you to listen to this. Look at verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was greatly angered and grieved when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he had discussions with the synagogue 
with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles in the marketplace day after day with any who happen to be there. Now listen to this. He's watching these idols. He's having a discussion about Jesus Christ. He's trying to change their mind. They've been into these gods and these idols for years, for centuries. These statues have been there way before Paul was even born. And some of the Epicureans and the Stalic philosophers, you know what the Epicureans were? These were men that studied Greek myth about Zeus, about Hercules, about all these different gods. And they specialized in this stuff. They knew this stuff like we knew scripture. They were scholars. They were theologians when it came to gods and goddesses. And it says, he had discussions with them, right? And stolo, stolo philosophers, that's the history of the Greek. They had generations. This, their grandfather was a philosopher. Then he passed it on down to the son. Then the son grew up. Then he passed it on down to the son. They lived, eat, and slept their traditions. You could not turn them away. Now listen to this. They engaged with the conversation. And some says, what could this idle babbler with this eccentric crap heap learning have in mind to say? This is how they talk about Paul presenting Christ. What kind of crap is this? They, 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 they didn't know. Listen to this. Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities. So they must have knew something about the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Strange deities. So there's three. The deities are always in threes. Every religion, after our belief, even the Hindus believe in threes. So they knew something, but they didn't fully understand it. Check this out. I want you to get this. He says, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They must have knew something about this. The Orthodox Jews must have told the Greek Jews about these people, of the way coming to explain about the Messiah already come, but the Jews engaged and told the Greek Jews that the Messiah had never came yet. So they must have knew something to Peter, James, and Jerusalem from them, or Paul, Apollos, Lucius, and one of them, Timothy, or Titus, or one of them, Priscilla, Aquila, or one of them, they had to know about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Paul says, I'd rather preach Christ and him crucified. So when you mention Jesus, you must acknowledge him dead, Buried, raising from the being crucified and being raised from the dead. There's no ends, no buts about it. Everything is centered around Christ and Him crucified and being risen. It's no ends. It, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is based. The deity of Christ is based because Colossians chapter 2 says the fullness of of the Godhead bodily, which is the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, is in Jesus Christ, and that we are mature or complete or made whole because of Jesus and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in Christ, which is in us. So it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Let me get back to this. Now, because he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection, verse 9, they took him and brought him to Arapagus, that's the hills of Aris, 
the great God of war. See, they had all these gods. They had the God of war. They had the God of fraternity. They had the they had gods to fit every area of your life when there's only one God that deals with all areas of your life. They had the slightest idea what Paul was talking about. But they put them on the spot before the whole town of Athens. And they took them to Erebus, Erebus, to the hill of Erebus, the Greek god of war, saying, may we know what this strange new teaching in which you're proclaiming. They knew nothing about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Nothing. Now listen. For you are bringing some startling and strange things to our ear, so we want to know what they mean. Now all the people of Athens, or the Athenians, and the foreigners, foreigners visit Athens. Check this out. They're visiting there used to spend their leisure time doing nothing other than telling and hearing strange new stories. That's all they did. We we'll sit at the market and have these conversations and sit right here on Mars, on Mars Hill, and be preaching a new thing and everybody's ears hearing and they just entertain each other with this stuff. They weren't even serious about Paul. But they were willing to hear him. It's some type of entertainment to mock God and to make fun of Jesus our Christ. Check this. Check this. Check this. Look at, look at verse 22. So Paul, standing at the center of Arapicus, which is Mars Hill, in, in the, in the, um, in the, uh, King James Version, men of Athens, this is Paul, I observe that everywhere I turn, I make throughout the city that you're very religious and superstitious and devoted in all respect. Now, as I was going along and carefully looking at the objects of worship, I came to an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, what you already worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you. Check this out. Now he's going to, it gives him an opportunity to present the true and living God. Listen to this. The God who created the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he's talking about our God, does not stay in temples made with hands. Not is he served by human hands as though he needs anything because it is he who gives <clears throat> to all people life, breath, and all things. Check this out. That's in Isaiah 43 and 5 that he's quoting that from. Write it down. He's quoting it from Isaiah 42 and 5. Write that down. He served... He is not served by human hands. He don't need anything because it is he who gives to all people life, breath, and all things. He's the God that created the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not stay in temples made by hands. Isaiah 42 and 5. Mark that down. And he made Look at verse 26. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and their boundaries of their lands and territories. This was so that they would seek God. Listen. And perhaps they might grasp for him and find God. Though he is not far from each and every one of you. For in him we live and move and exist. This is in him we actually have our being. 
as even some of your own poets have said. He was even quoting from the Greek poets. For we also are his children. So then, being God's children, we should not think that the divine nature, the deity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, see, you got to come with the Godhead when you teach this thing. He's talking about the divine deity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So then, being God's children, we should not think of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost being like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art and the imagination of a skilled man. Therefore, God overlooked and he disregarded the former ages of ignorance. See, he knew that you were ignorant up until this point. Now I'm showing you, Paul's showing you, Greek, how to serve God the right way. So God winked at your ignorance. He just, because you didn't know any better. You never was taught the word. Check this. Therefore, God overlooked and disregarded the former ages of ignorance. All these years, you were in ignorance. You didn't know any better. But now, he commands all men everywhere to repent. That is to change their old way of thinking. To regret their past sins and to seek God's purpose for their lives. Because he has set a day when he will judge an inhabited world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and destined for that task. And he has provided credible proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. Who is he talking about? Yeshua, comma, see, in the Greek, not in the Greek, but in the Aramaic in the original Hebrew tongue, is Jesus the Christ. It's Jesus Christos in Spanish. Okay? He has provided credible proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. I want you to, to write this down. Psalms 9 and 8. But David, you mentioned it. Psalms 96 verse 13. Write it down. In Psalms 98 and 9. That's your reference from the Old Testament from where Paul was ministering to the Greek people because they not yet had this New Testament at that time. So Paul was going back to the Old Testament scriptures. He was a scholar and bringing it to the, bringing it to the New Testament church before the Gentile Greeks. Remember when I told you that Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So, in this, Paul went back and was bringing from the old what was to the new by the Spirit of God, being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? So look at verse 32. Now when they heard the term resurrection from the dead, listen to this. When they heard about somebody dying and being resurrected, some mocked, some made fun. Some sneered and got angry. But others says, said, we will hear you again about this matter. So Paul left them. But some men joined him. Listen. So the word that he ministered, some men were wooed in by God's Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. And they joined Paul and start believing. And among them was somebody named Dionysus, a judge of the council of Areopagus, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. So, basically, in this teaching, I'm trying to show you that Paul had to go through hell. 
everywhere he went, there were some that believed, there were some that did not believe. But he ended up in Athens being a witness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ <coughs> to a place where <coughs> people did not want to believe the Word of God. They had their own religion. They had their own beliefs. They had their own way of life. Now, between these crazy Christians and the Greek Orthodox Jews and your typical modern-day Greek, Paul and the rest of these Hellenist Greeks that got converted over to Christ. In Greece, they went through pure hell. The church today is being made a mockery. It's going through pure hell. Especially for the ones that are really standing up for Christ. They're being opposed. They're being attacked. Just like Paul, just like Silas in the book of Acts. Most of you Greek Jews were in association with that island 100 miles away from Greece. Most of you Greek Jews were with the Christians. Many were from that island. I want you to turn with me to the book of Titus. Some more things I want to show you about these Christians. The book of Titus. Look at Let's go here. This is the Look at chapter one in the book of Titus. Start with verse 1. Now, this is Paul, the bond servant of God. What do you mean by bond servant? A servant that served God, but somebody that kept going back and forth to prison for the sake of this gospel. He was a bond servant. They kept arresting him, they kept putting him behind bars. And it says he's a bond servant of God and an apostle, special messenger personally chosen representative of Jesus Christ for the faith of God chosen ones and to lead and encourage them to recognize and pursue the knowledge of the truth which leads to godliness. This was Paul's job. What's the job of an, of an apostle? Their personally chosen representative of Christ for the faith of God's chosen to lead and encourage them in recognizing and pursuing the knowledge of the truth which leads to godliness and the purpose of God. That's what apostles are called to do, to teach on those principles. Based on the hope and divine guarantee of eternal life, the life which God, who is ever truthful without deceit, promised before the ages began. And at the appointed time, has made known his word and revealed it as his message through preaching and teaching, which was entrusted to me according to the command of God our Savior. Notice that it was a command of God. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace, and in a calm and spiritual well-being, 
from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Why did he talk about Titus? Why did he give props to Titus? Because Titus was the man of God over the church at Crete. He was the pastor of the Cretan church in Crete, which was a hundred miles away. See, after they ran Paul out of Greece, he sailed there. Listen to this. For this reason, I left you behind in Crete. I couldn't deal with him, but I left you behind. There was a certain relationship that Titus had where he can get his point across to the people in Greece and Crete. They loved Titus. But he was also opposed by many. But there were many that loved him. Do you get what I'm saying? There's going to be many that's going to receive your ministry. Because you were allotted or assigned to that particular person. Or that particular people group, in other words. That's better, people group. Some people are not going to receive you. Like the sister that made the comment about me being on the page with Victory Outreach and she didn't receive me. And she may have been the one that reported me to Facebook for teaching the word of God because she didn't want to hear what I had to say. So they restricted my account because of her. It may be her. Don't know. There's going to be people that's going to receive me. There's, not going, to be, there's going to be people that's not going to receive me. That means I was not meant for that people group if they don't receive me. That's between them and God. Now, there's some of you that receive me and can understand what I'm saying in the teachings and grasp what I'm saying. You are my people group. Some people, for some people, you're not an apostle to all nations. You might be an apostle to one particular nation. God may put you among just a certain group of people just to minister to that group of people and that group of people only. And he'll send you around to different, like, say, for example, in Africa. When I go to Kenya, I will go all over Kenya. Kenya's a big, massive land. I will go to different villages to teach and set up ministry. Go to the next one. Set up ministry. Because that's my people group that God has assigned me to go to. It may be a certain people group here in the United States that he has assigned me to only go to. You're the same way. When you're called, you're called to a certain people group. Don't have to necessarily be an apostle, but you could be a pastor, you could be a teacher, you could be an evangelist. But God will only send you to a certain group of people that fit your character, your personality. They feel what you feel. They understand what you understand. Heart to heart, you can confess one another's faults. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have a heart after one another. There's a kindred spirit. There's a f family spirit. You feel like you belong when he knits you with the right people. There are people here in my community that he has knitted me with. There's people that it started out that it seemed like we got to know each other, but it didn't work out, which means that they were never meant to be in the first place. The only thing you can do is make peace with them and go your way because they're not going to receive you. There's many that say they're going to receive you, but when you start teaching, oh, wait a minute, they back off. Why? Because they're not met. God didn't mean them to be there for you. It sounded good to their ears at the beginning, but all of a sudden you started teaching the truth and they got convicted or they got condemned or they felt you ain't my brother. You ain't my sister. Or they seen I was too black and my wife was too white. 
<laughs> you got some like that too. That won't come. I ain't listen to that man. He with that white woman. I ain't listen to that woman. She with that black man. She with that in. See, you hear all that in America. But let's go back to the word. Let's see what Titus is saying. For this reason, Paul says, I left you behind in Crete, so that you would set right what remains unfinished. What was remaining unfinished? What were we talking about that happened? They were opposing the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ through Paul's teachings. Some had issues. Now, let me go ahead and read this. So, you would set right what remained unfinished and appoint elders in every city I direct you. So, he wanted Titus to take men that were groomed in the things of God, that would not back down, that were strong. You had to be strong to deal with these kind of people that kept opposing the world all the time. So he had to appoint elders throughout Greece, throughout Crete, throughout the islands, throughout the neighborhoods, each town. Check this out. And appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, a man of unquestionable integrity, an elder, he's talking about that, the husband of one wife, he's talking about the description of an elder or a pastor during that time. A man of integrity, one wife, having children who believe, nor accused of being immoral and rebellious. For the overseer, here it goes, overseer, as God's steward must be blameless, or the pastor, or the elder, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not violent, or greedy for dishonest gain, but financially ethical. He must be hospitable to believers as well as strangers, a lover of what is good, sensible, upright, fair, devoted, self-disciplined, above reproach, whether in public or in private. He must hold firmly the trustworthy word of God as it was taught to him so that he will be able to both to give accurate instructions and sound, reliable, error-free doctrine to refute, to rise up against those who contradicted by explaining their error. So if people are in error, you're supposed to correct. So if people are in error, you're supposed to tell them when they're wrong. This is hard to do. Titus had a great task to try to change these people from their ideology and their philosophies. These were people that were embedded with this philosophy since they were born. There were generations and generations of idolatry in Crete and in Athens and in Thessalonica all over Greece. You have a great task when you have to go into uh, areas of the world to preach the gospel where it's never been preached. You got to take these people by the hand slowly and bring them up. You got to come foundational, baby. You can't go over their head just teaching <coughs> stuff that they don't grasp and don't get. You have to take your time and explain it to them. You may have to explain to them over and over. This is the spirit of the Christians. But they were ready to put up their dukes and oppose you. And the Zeus in the gods and goddesses that they believed in. So it wasn't easy for them to convert over to your salvation to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. It was hard. 
Most countries have already heard about Jesus. Most countries that I've gone to have already just asked me to come back because they already know the word. They're trying to grow and get a more of a better foundation. They know of Jesus already. So it's a little bit more easier coming in and operating in the gifts and the power of God and touching other people's lives. Verse what Paul and Silas and them had to go through. That's why I had to read this about the spirit of the Christians. Because we're about to come across the people that don't understand a doctrine. And we have to know this word and know how to explain it so they can get it. We have to win them over. Do you get what I'm saying? Where was I? Look at verse 16. The reason why they had to give error-free doctrine. Listen. The reason why they had to come and they had to refute those who contradicted by bringing their error in their religion. Check this out in verse 16. For there are many rebellious men. Now, he's not just talking about people that didn't receive Jesus. He's talking about the ones that received Jesus too. That are still rebellious in the way they believe in things and they're mixing it and with the doctrine that Paul is teaching. So it's a spirit of confusion among the church of Thessalonica. It's a thing of confusion among the church in Athens. It was a thing of confusion in Berea. It was a thing of confusion a hundred miles south on the islands of Crete with the Cretans. And Titus had to straighten this mess out. It's messed up, isn't it? Check this. There are many rebellious men who are empty talkers, just windbags, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, those Jews who insist that the Gentile believers must be circumcised. Sounds like the Jews in Jerusalem, didn't it? Sounds like the argument they had in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. Hmm? I don't think that big argument they had. They wanted them circumcised. Same thing among the Gentiles. They wanted them circumcised. Like the Jews. Check this. Those Jews insist the Gentiles believers must be circumcised and keep the law in order to be saved. But we live under the grace. How are you keeping the law? If you're going to live by the law, you're going to be judged and die by the law, and you're not going to make it. So how can you live by the law and live by grace? Because some churches today have the spirit of the Christians where they live by the law and by grace at the same time instead of bringing the correct scriptures over to fulfill the law to be under the right grace. Let me repeat that. Some believe just the law. They leave grace out. But do not believe in Jesus when he says, I came to fulfill the law and bring it over to the New Testament. And that scripture would be kosher to be under the dispensation of grace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All the other hocus pocus stuff in the Old Testament can stay there. But there's certain scriptures that you have to bring to the new. And they should have already been brought over to the new. You have to be able to decipher what the difference is. If Peter says in Acts chapter 3 verse 17 that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. His sons and daughters shall prophesy. His old men shall dream dreams. His young men shall see visions. That's for the New Testament. Paul says, Peter says, this is what you see today from the prophet Joel, from the Old Testament. 
And it was being brought over to the, because it was never presented in the Old Testament. It was only spoken in the Old Testament. But the manifestation came out when the new dispensation of time, which is grace right now, came. So it was time for Joel 2.28 to be fulfilled now that we're living under grace. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 28 that I will speak to my people with stammering lips and other tongues. Well, I speak unto my people, yet this is the rest which causes the weary to rest, Hebrew chapter 4. And this is the refreshing of God, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. You need to read those scriptures to understand what I'm saying. But I'm quoting this from Isaiah 28, verse 11 through 12. How did they get the scriptures to come over with the tongues? Because tongues was not spoken in the Old Testament. How did Isaiah know? Because the Holy Spirit through God revealed it to him that it was to come in this dispensation of time. So Isaiah 28 right now became Acts chapter 2. Do you understand what I'm saying? By Jesus saying he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. I'm trying to speak slow so you can get it. But the Christians didn't get it. They believed like the Orthodox Jews. There were many that believed in their Greek gods. And it was hard for them to come out of the thought pattern of Zeus and of them being God versus the God they were supposed to bow to. And all these other idols that they worshipped. They were in a bit of confusion. But they were philosophers. They were very smart. The Greek were some of the most intelligent people you ever want to meet in society during that time. Especially when they ruled the earth. Now, check this. Check this. Check this. I want you to get this. For there are many rebellious men with empty talkers, just windbags, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, those Jews who insist that the Gentile believers must be circumcised. Those are the Jews that were Greek Orthodox Jews that were opposing them. Check this out. And keep the law and they insist that the Gentile believers must be circumcised to keep the law to be saved. I don't get it. The Bible says by grace you are saved. Not of yourself, lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9. And it says, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus and that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, verse 8 through 9. It says, the word of faith is near you, even in your mouth. The word of faith which we preach. That if you speak that name, and you believe that he died for the cross for your sins, you shall be saved. Listen to this. Verse 11. Paul says that these people that oppose the word of God, that are talking all this crap about their religion and trying to mix it in with Jesus Christ, he says they must be silenced. Shut them up. Because they are upsetting whole families by teaching things they should not teach for the purpose of dishonest financial gain. Now, I want you to take a notice in verse 12. One of them goes by the name of Epimetus, who was a Christian. Listen to this. A prophet of their own, not of Christ. Now, mind you, they started out right by getting Paul's teachings. And then they kind of mixed in their belief in their religion and with the gospel of Jesus Christ. No can do, baby. And this man got up, was their prophet, and said, Christians are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. The description is true, so rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in faith and free from doctrinal error. 
when they got converted to Christ along with the Greek and along with the Orthodox Jews, they accepted the teachings, but many would not change their way of life and their character and the way they believed. There were five ways that these Greeks, that these Greeks and these Christians, I'm talking about the spirit of a Christian, there were five ways they would, they would lie and be deceitful. Number one, they twisted the word of God that Paul the Apostle and Titus brought to them for financial gain to win people over to their side. This is one of the biggest schemes in the church today where the word of God is being ministered, itching ears, false prophecies are going forth to get people's money. And you steady giving to them. Why? When they're not teaching from the word, they're just giving you something for your ear to hear to make you feel good. The Christians were doing this as well as the Orthodox Jews that got converted. Number two, they were prophesying falsely. They told stories about things that never happened. They were liars. They over-exaggerated things and stories to impress people to believe them so they can win the crowds. You know that's in the church today. I can preach better than you. I got more people than you. It's not a competitive thing, my brother. It's not a competitive thing, my sister. It's about winning souls. It's about people being delivered, set free. How many have you set free? How many have you laid hands on lately? How many have you spoken to people's life and taught the word to bring them out of bondage? Or you were just teaching them to make them feel good? Number three, many were teaching, like we've said in the scripture, to walk in the law of Moses and the old prophets and not walk by grace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Greek people were doing this. The Greek Orthodox Jews were doing this. They were stirring people up. This is why Paul had to ask God, Lord, take this away from me three times with the thorn. Because this was very aggravating. Every time he went in the synagogue, every time he got ready to teach, the mobs would come after him for teaching the truth. I just get opposed on Facebook. I just get my account shut down for six or seven days for teaching the truth. Am I going to stop? No. Am I going to stop teaching the word with boldness? No. Am I going to stop teaching with conviction? Heck to the no. And you can't stop me. God told me to do this. I'm not doing this on my own accord. He told me to do this. Now, whether you hear me or not and want this, that's on you. Look at number four. They're a cultish. They're a cultish greed. God myth. A goddess myth. Versus the God of the Bible, they would teach it to live this way according to their cult. Versus the teachings of Jesus Christ. Or some were mixing it and confusing people in the church of Thessalonica, in the church of Berea, in the church of Athens, in the church of Crete. Typical Greek. 
Paul assigned Titus, who understood the mindset and the heart of the Christian people and the Greek people. He got along with them. He was able to espound and get doctrine, of course, where they could understand it. But Paul couldn't. You see, they opposed him on Mars Hill. Tell him, oh, you can come back another day. Paul ain't get nobody saved in Athens. He ain't get nobody saved there. He had to get Titus up there to do the, to do the work. He had to get Timothy and Silas in there to do the work. So he had to send Titus with the doctrine so he can get the church in order and get the correct adequate and everything right in order. So everybody would be on one accord speaking the same thing. That was a very difficult task for Titus. Very difficult. It'd be very difficult for me and you. Because half of us don't even know the word of God like they know. I know some. But I wasn't no scholar like Paul and Titus, Titus and the rest of them. Them boys is bad. But the biggest problem with the Cretans that they had, and God hates this. He hates liars and deceivers. It looked like the spirit of the Cretans already hit our modern day church. We got a bunch of liars, people that over exaggerate in the pulpits, will not be willing to teach the truth in love. They tell all, all these little sob stories like the Christians. And God, wants the spirit of the Christians out of the church. Out. Look at all what Paul and Silas and Titus had to go through through Acts chapter 17 and through, and through Titus 1, 10 through 16. Look at all this foolishness they had to go through. Look at verse 14 in Titus chapter 1. The Grecians were liars. So Paul agreed. Description of them are true. He said, now rebuke them sharply. Get this house in order. Set them straight that they will not walk in error anymore. Bring sound doctrine in faith and free them from doctrinal errors. Not paying attention to Jewish myth and commandments and rules of men who turn their backs on the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. What is he saying? To people that receive the word, the pure. But to the corrupt and unbelieving, to the people that believe in this, to the people that believe lies, nothing is pure anymore. Both their minds and their conscience are corrupt. And they profess to know God, to recognize, to be acquitted with him, acquainted with him, not acquitted, acquainted with him. For they profess to know God, to be recognized and acquainted with him, but by their actions, they deny and disown him. They're detestable, disobedient, worthless for good work of any kind. But what do you mean by their actions? What else did they do other than what they already did? Paul assigned Titus to straighten this mess out, didn't he? But let's see what God's word 
says about these liars. These people of deceit. These evil spirited people. Number one. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 16. Through 19. Says number one. God hates a lying tongue. Number two, people who spread lies and don't tell the whole truth and use it to destroy others are not going to make it. So if you're in the church doing this, you need to stop. Other than error, you need to straighten out your character. You need to become mature in the things of God. Number three, according to Revelations 21 and 8, God will make sure liars and receivers will be eternally regret that the deception they refuse to renounce. And if they stop doing, if they don't stop lying, that they will hear their lies echo in their memory in the pit of hell. The Bible says the liars are going to the lake. God hates it because it's contrary to the truth. Number four, they practice deceit. Psalms 101.7 says, God doesn't even want you in his house. You want to speak falsely? I don't even want you in my presence. You want to continue to lie and be like the Cretans? Don't want you, don't need you. Mark 7, 20 through 23 says, when you practice deceit, it's, it's not what and it's what comes out of a man. This is what Jesus says in Mark. That determines who he is. When he speaks out of his mouth and acts out, he'll be judged by every idle word. That is spoken in the judgment. So it's what's come out of you. The anger. The clamor. The bitterness. The unforgiveness. The hate. The racism. All of that comes out of you. Comes from your heart. And you're going to be judged. By every idle word that you speak. Now, Proverbs 6 is a very interesting chapter. I'm not going to go there, but I'm kind of going to give you an outline of what it says. It talks about, in verse 1 through 6, if you promise to pay somebody back and you think you want to get over on them, you need to let them know that you can't do it. You need to be honest. And not lie. And just take them for their money. Because you're even going to be judged. In that. When people have done you favors. Bent over backwards. And you took advantage of them. And you used them. And you sat up on it. And you drove their car for free. And you didn't contribute nothing to the house. And they gave everything to you. And you just sat there and took total advantage and knew that you couldn't pay them back for what they did for you. That's what Proverbs 
chapter one through six. How many people you know like that? Then verse six to 10 or six to 11. If you think you can go around and use and deceive people, it tells you to take the lesson from the ant. The ant works. The ant puts things together. Because if you continue to be lazy and you don't take the lesson from the ant and you continue to use people and take advantage of people, this is living a lie. And you're not going to make it according to scripture. You need to read Proverbs chapter 6. Read it. Read it. We need to look at our, we need to look at ourselves as a reflection in the mirror and make correction. There were times in my past where I used to over exaggerate and lie. I didn't think of it as nothing until the Holy Spirit convicted me. And I started paying attention to what I say and how I say things and what I'm saying. Because the Bible says all liars are going to be like, and they're all going to be judged. So, Brother Johnson, I'm a perpetual liar. Brother Johnson, I'm a person that can never tell the truth. Brother Johnson, I've fallen like these spirit of Christians. What can I do? Look at Psalms 120. Look at verse 2. Look what David prayed to God. Save me, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Look at Psalms 19. Giving you instructions on what you do. If you are a liar. If you over-exaggerate and tell me you have it. Some of you have. Some of you have not told the truth all the way. Come on now. You've been hiding under the crevices. You've been telling false stories. Come on now. Let's be honest. I know I felt a couple of times that I said some things and I had to come back and repent. Because sometimes we miss it. We're creatures of the flesh. We don't want nobody to know all of our business. So we tend, we, we tend to lie a little bit. Because we don't want folk all up in our bizwhack. And I understand that. But there's certain things that should be said and there's certain things that should not be said. Look at this. Look at chapter 19. And look at uh, verse 12. It says, who can understand his errors? Nobody. Or his omissions when he sins. Equip me from hidden unconscience and unintended faults or sins. Father, deliver me or equip me from hidden sins that I don't see. Help me to see myself. That's what you're asking God to do. And what he's going to do, he's going to show you you, where you messed up at. Unconscious, unattended faults. Also, keep your servant from presumptuous. In other words, willful sins that my flesh continues to want to do. Deliberate sins that I just do by habit. And I'm trying to stop it. Let them not have rule over me. Say it. Let these sins not have rules over me. Let these lies not have rule over me. See, I'm giving you the antidote to come out of the spirit that the Christians is bringing to the church. You got to make correction in your life. You got to get stirred up. Fired up. Let them not have rule or control over me. Then I will be blameless and complete or mature. And I shall be acquitted of the great transgressions. Then 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord. You're my firm, immovable rock, and you're my redeemer. Why do we always quote that last scripture? Let the words, but we forget verse 11 on down. We don't want to read that part. We don't want to repent of our secret sins and our habitual sins. And some of those sins can be like the Cretans. Like Epidema said, they're liars. They're liars. Proverbs 21 and 6. Let's go there. I'm, getting, I'm almost done. Proverbs 21 and 6. Acquiring, okay. Acquiring treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor. The seeking and pursuit of death. What is he saying here? When a person acquires treasure, he acquires riches. He has a lot of it. But if he lies, just like the treasure that he has, in other words, he acquires treasures, right? And he's saying to him, by a lying tongue, how did he get what he got? He lied to get it. By fleeting a vapor, the seeking and the pursuit of death. What it does, check this out. Trying to get money and lying for it is like breathing and choking. And you will suddenly die because of greed. It's like you choking, getting ready to die. That's what that's like. Look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. My wife's going to join me soon. Lying lips are extremely disgusting to the Lord. It's abomination. That's what the King James Version says, right? Let's see, 22. Lying lips are extremely disgusting to the Lord, but those who deal faithfully are his delight. Look at John chapter 8. Look what Jesus said about lies. John chapter 8. Almost done. Look at verse... 44. John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus says, You are the Father. You are of your Father, the devil. He's talking to these scribes and Pharisees. You are of your Father, the devil. It is your will to practice. The desires which are the characteristics of your father. Listen to what it says. Listen to this. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand. Listen to this. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks what is natural to him. It's like callous to him. Just right out of his mouth. 
For he is a liar and the father of lies and half truth. And because I speak the truth, you do not believe me and continue in your unbelief. You believe the father of lies, which is Satan. So how can you come to the knowledge of the truth? How? You believe a half lie? Or you believe half of the truth? What is it? What the scripture is saying, when you lie, your father, the devil, controls you. Not God, not, God, not Jesus. It's your father, the devil, that's controlling you. It's the spirit of lies. The spirit of decretions is in you and on you. When you lie, you're of the father, the devil. Colossians 3.19 says, don't lie, but put off your old self. Die to the flesh. Commit that lying tongue to God. The Bible says in the book of James, it's full of poison. It can lead to death. It can get you there quick, fast, in a hurry. You got to be careful with the words that you speak out of your mouth because you're going to be judged by every idle word. That you speak. Look at First Timothy chapter four, verse two. It says that you lie by habit. First Timothy four and two. You lie by habit, and you can't stop lying because your conscience is seared like a hot iron. It's like a hard callus. Nothing can penetrate. So how do I get to that point where I get delivered? Where I get set free? We just read you two scriptures in Psalms. 120 and 2. Save me, Lord, from lying lips and a deceitful tongue. Father, deliver me from presumptuous sins. Believe me, deliver me from habitual sins. Believe me from sin, forgive me for sins and deliver me from sins that try to control me that I don't see. Let them not have dominion over me, O oh God. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51, verse 4 through 8. Start presenting yourself before God as a living sacrifice. According to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Be not conformed to the things, of, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do it? The word of God. Anything that speaks the truth against your lies, you confess it. Father, I speak the truth, but I will not lie anymore. I will speak the truth in love. I won't lie. I put off the old self. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. Look at Hebrew chapter 6. Show you something else. Two more chapters and we're getting out of here. And hold your horses and put it on Numbers chapter 23 and 19. So Hebrews chapter 6 first. Let's go there. Got to get out of here in a minute. Look at verse 18. Start with let's start with verse 16. Indeed, men swear or make an oath by one greater than themselves, and with them in all disputes the oath serves as a confirmation of what has been said and is an end to the dispute. Okay? In the same way, 
God in his desire to show the heirs of the promise the unchangeable nature of his purpose intervene and guarantee with an oath. God made a promise to us so that by two unchangeable things, his promise, his oath, in which is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to him for refuge would have strong encouragement and dwelling strength to hold tightly to the hope that's set before us. So if God's not a God that's going to lie and he keeps his promise, because he explained about an oath, when we make a promise, we keep that promise, and God made an oath to us and he kept his promise. What it says that we need to get into God and hold on to him so tight that we would not get away. We would stay right there, believing, not move. But we would believe until our change is coming. We will believe until the blessing of God says, yea and amen is coming. We will believe God until the promises of God comes. Until the hope of God comes. Because he's not a God that he can lie. Turn to Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. And we're going to get out of here. 23 and 19. Got to show you these scriptures. Take you step by step. God is not a man that he should lie. What does it say? God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Didn't he say he was going to do what he said he was going to do? Will he not do it? He's asking you a question. Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good and fulfill it? Behold, I have received his command to bless, and he has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. God is not a liar. So you don't have to be a liar anymore. The grace of God is here. So you don't have to lie anymore. So you don't have to cheat anymore. So you don't have to deceive anymore. All you got to do is bow and give it to him. We gave you instructions on how to come out of the spirit of a person that operates under the spirit of a Christian. Because Christian's a liar. You're part of the household of faith. You're part of God's elect. God is not a man that he should lie. You should not be a man that you should lie. Father, I ask you to help the people that are bombarded with over-exaggeration lies trying to impress. Forgive them for their sins. Forgive me for my sins for when I did it. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to walk upright in you. Help us to walk in the spirit of truth. Deliver us from the top of our heads, from the soles of our feet creating us a clean heart and renew a right, steadfast spirit within us. Clean us up, Lord. Take not your Holy Spirit from us. We repent for the lies and over-exaggerating tongue that we spoke, for the poison that we spoke. Help us, Lord God. Strengthen us that we would not walk like these Christians who are liars, that we will walk in pure doctrine that's without error and it's the truth. Teach us, oh God. Renew our minds as we present our body and our tongue a living sacrifice and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I gotta take two steps for me and get out of here. We'll be back with Lisa. It's not a part two, but we have another message for you coming up on Restoring Unified Radio Ministries. Listen to our flagship station, www.RestoringUnifiedRadio.com. It's a 24 hours a day syndicate. 
right here on your dial on the internet. You should watch the videos, everything for free. Men of God, music, the whole nine yards. We're absolutely free. And um, for you, we love you to life. Lisa will be back on the next episode. Okay? Ciao.